Today, I want to ask you to give yourself permission. See, a lot of our weeks were good. They were about maybe you dealt with a petty offense. Somebody cut you off in traffic. These things can happen from time to time. Today, what I hope we can do is take a deep dive. You know, David in the Old Testament would say this to the Lord. He said, search my heart, O God, if there's anything that's not of you. Search me, God. Let me know. And today, what I think is what I hope we can get through the next few minutes together on is taking a deep dive on offense and where we need to give forgiveness. I want to ask you to give yourself permission today to take a deep dive in areas that you have tried to ignore, that there's possibly cobwebs in the corners of your soul that you didn't want to deal with, that you think that is just for another day. I'm praying that today is the day that we look at some areas that we thought were impossible to forgive and we say to the Lord, I'm willing to let you do a work in me, even at my own discomfort, even at my own pain, because God, you have more for me than settling for areas that I refuse to let your forgiveness shine in my life. Today, I want to title this message, When Forgiveness Seems Impossible. When Forgiveness Seems Impossible. Let's pray. Father, it is so good when your church gathers together. God, I enjoy so much Sundays just seeing our church family and us worshiping together and communing together and having godly fellowship with one another. But God, also, God, we don't ignore that your word has some things it wants to teach us that you want to guide us and direct us. And here's what I know about you, God. You love every one of us too much to leave us in our brokenness and our sin and where the world and sin has caused damage in our souls. You want to heal. And the Bible declares who the sun sets free is free indeed. So God, I'm asking for you to do a supernatural work today as we dive into where we need to forgive and God, where we've been carrying offenses. God, let us end this series with a bang. God, truly seeing the transformational power of the gospel. In Jesus' name, and everyone agreed said. Amen. And everyone agreed said. Amen. So I'm gonna jump into Colossians chapter one. We're we'll look at verse 13 and we're gonna bounce off of that. But I just wanna set the table with Colossians chapter one. Let's just walk through it a little bit. Here's what it says. For he, this is God, has rescued. Somebody say rescued. He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness, okay? So it's interesting. The Greek word, I want to give it to you, for rescue is erosato, okay? Erosato. It feels like a Japanese word, but it's a Greek word, okay? Erosato. All right, never mind. All right. It, and here's what, yeah, y'all don't know what you signed up for today. <laughs> and here's what I want you to know. That word in the Greek, when it talks about rescued, is not just getting you out of a bad situation, not just bailing you out from a weird moment with somebody. It literally means to snatch somebody out of danger, to literally grab somebody out of danger. There's a, it goes even deeper. It talks about even saving a child, someone innocent, from a dangerous situation. I, a couple years ago, you might have saw this. It was a national story. There was a crossing guard named Annette Goodyear, and she was a crossing guard, and she helped kids during the morning get from you know, point A to point B, crossing the street. And one day as she was doing it, she noticed a car was not stopping when it was supposed to stop, and a child was crossing the street. And she made a split-second decision to grab the child and throw the child out of the way, and she actually got hit by the car as she went to rescue this child. Now, she was on Good Morning America, it went national. And the idea was this. She was willing to sacrifice herself to protect an innocent little one. And, and church, I got to tell you, when I think about Jesus and the story of the gospel, he stepped into a space he didn't have to step into. He got in the way of the damage that was meant for me, and he rescued me from darkness. See, I think there's some of us, if we're painfully honest, we have been professional Christians for too long. We have been pretending and going through the motions of Christianity for too long. And if you're not careful, you forget to appreciate the fact that you were broken, jacked up, messed up, screwed up. You had no right to God. You had, every, you had a one-way ticket to hell itself. But God stepped in and rescued you and put himself in the line so that you could be saved. I think some of us, we've been professional Christians so long that we forget the goodness of God for saving us. And here's what happens. When you lose your gratitude, when you lose your appreciation, can I say it like this? When you lose your awe and wonder towards the greatness of God in your life, 
it makes it easier to let sin back in. It makes it easier for you to settle for mediocre. It makes it easier for you to cope with the pain of this world, not by in God's presence, but by doing things that are not of God. And here's what I want to encourage you with. Holiness matters. And when you stand before a holy God and you realize that he saved you in spite of your lack of holiness, it shouldn't drive you to keep sinning. It should drive you to say, God, I want to be more like you. Because God, thank you for saving me. Now change me from who I've been to who you're calling me to be. And so I want to encourage you. We have been rescued from near death like Annette did in that moment for that child. And God wants to remind you that he rescued you from darkness itself. But let's keep reading because this gets even better. He goes, and then it brought us into, somebody say into. into. The kingdom that the son of he, that he loves. So, so not only has God saved us from something, but he has called us to something. God hasn't just saved you from hell. He's called you to heaven. He hasn't just saved you from sin. He's called you to be sanctified. God has called you. See, here's the problem. There's a lot of us who say yes to Jesus. And we're like, God, I want you to forgive me. And then we just keep focusing on our sin, our sin, our sin, our sin. And the problem with that is you have to start focusing on what God has given you, not just what he's brought you from. So like, I am not just saved as a sinner. I am also now a citizen to the kingdom of God. I am an heir and a son to the king. And some of us have to start walking in our priestly royalhood that God has called us beyond just being saved. He's called us to something as well. Recently, I was reading this New York Times article called Resistance is Futile. To change your habits, you have to replace them instead. To change your habits. See, see, we just want to resist. Like, I just don't sin, don't sin, don't sin, don't sin. Every time you say don't sin, what do you end up doing? They actually did a study in this article, and they said, if you try to not think of a white polar bear, and you do everything inside of you not to think of a white polar bear. Let's try it. One, two, three. Don't think of a white polar bear. I always think of the Coca-Cola commercial, the bear just going around, right? It says, the harder you try not to do something, the more likely it is that you will do it. So instead of just not focusing on it, they actually drew it on a napkin I want to show you right here. Don't look, don't look, don't look. But that's what we try to do. What we really need to do is say, look over here. Look at what God is doing in my life. Look at where you go. Look at what I need to set my, the Bible says, set your eyes on him. Don't just focus on the fact that it's hard. This life is difficult. But you have to remind yourself, I'm not just a citizen of this earth. I am now an heir of God and I am a citizen of God heaven. I think there's some of us, we've got some sin issues that we're focused on, and I get it. We want to overcome it, but you've got to replace those sin habits with sanctified habits. You've got to go from, hey, you know what? I always hung out with this group of friends, and even though they're not followers of Jesus, they're all I know. You can still love them and believe in them and want God's goodness for them, but maybe you got to quit flying with the buzzard so much if you want to start soaring with the eagle, somebody. Am I wrong? See, I think what happens is, is people, we get so accustomed to all we know, and we think this is my lot in life, but God calls you to a higher level, and he wants you, like maybe instead of just associating with people who are not following Jesus, love those people, but maybe hop on the dream team here at Rust City, start serving, start making godly friendships, and realize the better I make my friendships, the higher I elevate my life. Maybe, just maybe, I need to evaluate where I'm spending my time when it comes to binge-watching that show for the 10th time. It's getting quiet in here. Come on, somebody. (laughs) Sometimes you're like, well, you know what? I just like it, so I rewatch it again. And I get it. That's fun. But can I tell you, the hours you're wasting doing that, just this week, I felt like I was watching too much mind-numbing TV. And I turned it off. I opened up my Bible, and I said, Holy Spirit, would you just speak to me tonight? And at the end of my time with him, I realized I felt so much better after spending time with him than re-watching that show for the 10th time. Maybe you need to replace your normal habits and your normal things with something better and more godly. I think so often we spend our money and we can't even remember where we spend it on. What if we began to invest our resources in heavenly places? What if we started sowing into the kingdom of God and sowing in opportunities to be a blessing to people? You would start realizing how I treat my money matters. So you can't just say don't do. You have to say I will do this now. And then it goes on to say this. You are now brought in as a kingdom of heaven, a son that he loves in whom 
We have redemption from Jesus to the forgiveness of our sins. Somebody say forgiveness. forgiveness. Now, when I think of forgiveness, I think about the symbol of the cross. Okay, the cross is taller and then it's wide. And when I think about it, I think of it like this. The cross is God up here coming down to humanity down here and forgiving me of sin that I can never forgive myself of. But the cross also symbolizes as God has forgiven me, I now must forgive those around me. And when I create this moment, I am actually living the faith that the cross represents. It's not just enough for me to be forgiven from God. It also requires me to forgive others of the debts that they owe me. And when I do this, I begin to activate the power of the cross in my life. Let me give you a story that Jesus said. It's a parable, but it's a story that he told that I think will make this very, very clear for you and I. Matthew chapter 18, verse 23 says this. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like, anytime Jesus says this, he's wanting you to know this is what heaven is like and this matters to God. It is like a certain king who wanted to settle the accounts of all of his servants. And when he had begun to settle the accounts, uh, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 Talents. Now, remember that. I'm going to tell you how much 10,000 talents is in today's money. But this was a currency. He owed him 10,000 talents. Verse 25. But he was not able to pay. His master commanded that he be sold with his wife and his children and all they had until the payment was made. That's a pretty harsh judgment. You're sold, your wife, your kids, everything you got, and now you have to work in prison until you pay me back my 10,000 talents. The servant, this is the one who's going to go to prison, therefore fell down before him saying, Master, have patience with me. I will pay you all. Verse 27, then the master of the servant was moved with compassion. He saw him begging and he said, you know what? I am moved with compassion. He released him and check this out, forgave him of all his debts. He didn't have to pay it back. He was actually forgiven. Imagine your house payment, your car payment, your medical bill, everything being forgiven in one moment. Anybody want that? If you don't, you're crazy. Every debt he owed was immediately forgave. And I was like, wow, this is the story of the gospel. We couldn't pay back this debt and God did it. But check this out. Let's continue to read. But verse 28, but the servant went out and he found a fellow servant, a coworker who owed him a hundred denarii. And I'm going to tell you how much a hundred denarii is in today's currency. He owed him a hundred denarii. Here's what he did. He laid hands on him, took him by the throat. Sounds like somebody in the parking lot of Rust City after a service one day. Took him by the throat. <laughs> Come on, somebody. And he says, pay me what you owe me. So that other servant, that coworker, fell down at his feet and begged him. Sounds similar, doesn't it? Saying, have patience with me. I will pay you all. But then, and I felt like, okay, cool. He's going to forgive him. But then verse 30 sneaks in. For he would not forgive him, but went and threw him into prison until he paid his debt. So you have this man who was forgiven 10,000 talents, and he has someone who owes him 100 denarii, and he refused to forgive the person who owed him 100 denarii. Now, I did the math. One talent in today's currency, I figured it out. I times it by 10,000. Today, if you owed 10,000 talents in American currency, you actually owe $223 million. If you have that and you're able to pay it back, please tell me I want to be your friend. <laughs> $223 million he owed. Now, I did the math on 100 denarii, and 100 denarii in today's currency is just under $6,000. So he owed $223 million. His master forgave him of this, said, you don't even have to pay it back, you're forgiven. He literally walks out of that moment, sees someone who owes him money, and says, no, you owe me just under $6,000. You pay it, go to jail, and work off the debt, because I refuse to forgive like I have been forgiven. Listen, I'm not sneezing at 6000 bucks, y'all. It's a lot of money. But in comparison to $223 million, what are we talking about? We have been forgiven $223 million of sin by God, but yet we will not offer $6,000 of forgiveness to those around us. 
And I'm here to encourage you. The cross does not become active in your life going just this way. It has to stretch out this way as well. And you've got to be willing to say, yeah, that, that debt does hurt. I do feel wronged. I have been offended. I do feel that you owe me. But God, in comparison of what you've done to me, how dare I? withhold forgiveness to those that have wronged me. I'm not saying you have to let them back into a certain space or place. I'm not saying that you have to let them abuse you again. I'm not saying any of that. But I am saying there is a condition inside of our souls that needs to be healed, that needs to be addressed. And we need to recognize that if I'm refusing to give forgiveness, I'm literally spitting in the face of the cross of Calvary because he would forgive me of all of my debt to him. How dare I not forgive the debt of others around me? The only way we can forgive when it feels impossible is to recognize and have gratitude for how much God has forgiven us. And when we do that, we say, God, help me forgive others around me. So I have this card that was dropped at your seat. And this card simply says, I need to forgive. I need to forgive. And I left a blank. And originally, I was only going to have one line. And I realize for a lot of us, we might have more than one line worth of forgiveness we need to write down on there. And let me tell you, Steph, can you come up and play for me, please? When I look at this moment, there's some of us that have situations and issues and pain points that we have to be willing to look at and say, God, where do I need to forgive? Where do I need to forgive? It it might be a situation it, 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 you might need to write down, God, I need to forgive you of some things that have hurt me. God, I, I've got some pain points in my life that I need you to help me with right now. But I want you, and they're gonna keep the lights on for this moment. I want you to take a moment as I've invited them to sing. And I'm gonna invite some of our dream teamers. They're gonna bring the cross that we have up front. And just for a few moments while you're sitting, I want you to write down the areas that you say, as the Holy Spirit prompts your mind, I need to forgive this. God, I've been forgiven and I need to forgive this in my life. And as you do that, let's take a few minutes and let's just let God move. Let's let him move in our hearts and our lives and let's see what happens. So I'm going to kick it over to them. Stay in your seat and let's do some business with God as we work through where I need to forgive. just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this holy moment. I never want to leave. Lord, I'm not here for blessings. She you don't know 